was in the 1960s, but after about 1970, few nationally prominent entertainers came to work, preferring other Quad City venues such as the Masonic Temple and the Coliseum Ballroom in Davenport, and of course beginning in 1993, the mark of the Quad Cities, which is now the I Wireless Center. Ah, it's time for quiz. Okay, I'll give you a little background. On October 26, 1966, 74-year-old Paul Douglas arrived to campaign for his fourth term as United States Senator from Illinois. He brought along a young Ted Kennedy, who's shown here. Here's the quiz. Who did Douglas run against and who won? No response. This is the 60s, this is recent. <laughs> no, not Dirksen. I think Dirksen was the other senator at the same time as Douglas for, for a long time. Charles Percy. Charles Percy. And that happened uh, just 10 days after Douglas was here. On a chilly October evening in 1968, Richard Nixon, the former vice president at the time, was greeted at the Quad City Airport by 4,500 cheering fans. Then the next afternoon, 6,500 packed the field house to hear and see the future president. Some 4,000 others were turned away. The 1968 visit of Alabama Governor George Wallace, who was running for president, created considerable controversy at Wharton. A staunch segregationist, Wallace attract, well, attracted more than 6,500 people to Wharton, but among them were 200, at least 200 vocal protesters, mostly students from Augustana and Black Hawk Colleges, who opposed Wallace's racist views. A high school basketball highlight at Wharton was a tele television broadcast for the first time in color of the moline Galesburg game on February 15, 1968. The Maroons won 67-65, there they are celebrating. Uh, they beat the Silver Streaks, who were the top-ranked team in the state at that time. The Harlem Globetrotters visited Wharton most years between 1950 and 1993. Before their 1971 visit, a contest was held for boys and girls who were asked to respond in 25 words or fewer to the statement, I like basketball because winners were announced at this Saturday gathering, advertised here, which was the day before the Sunday game. On Sunday, a massive, the massive crowd that showed up for the game frustrated promoter Mike Fitzgerald, who was quoted as saying, cars were backed up across the Bettendorf Bridge. It was one of the saddest days of my life. We had to turn away at least 3,000 people. Kids were crying all over the place. <laughs> Over the years, many student activities have been held at Wharton. On the left is a 1971 festival at which high school students would sign up for organizations and activities. On the right, the arena is being decorated uh, last, it was February, for the uh, 2013 Sadie Hawkins dance. Girls high school basketball began at Wharton in 1974. On the right is a 2010 photograph of Markeisha Harris who was named to the All-State team three times. The attractiveness of Wharton's interior is enhanced by the banners that are hung from the rafters. These banners commemorate the ten times the Moline girls have gone to the Sweet 16 level in the state tournament. Interscholastic girls volleyball competition began at Moline High School in 1975. The team began playing home matches at Warden in 1997. The Quad City Thunder played at Warden in Minor League Continental Basketball Association from 1987 to 1993. Their home attendance averaged of over 4,000 per game at the Fieldhouse. In 1993, they moved to the Mark. In the late 90s, attendance steadily declined and then the team and the entire league folded in 2000. Ann Potter DeLong, pictured here in 1989 at the Fieldhouse, owned the Thunder from 1987 to 1996. 
She was named CBA Executive of the Year in 1988-89. The Fieldhouse was the only CBA arena where beer was not sold. It was also older and smaller than many of the others. In the Thunder's first season, Rockford Lightning coach Charlie Rosen called the Fieldhouse a phone booth. <laughs> the next time he was in town, someone brought in a cardboard phone booth and set it up in midcourt before the game. <laughs> During that and subsequent Rosen appearances, a telephone ring was blasted over the public address system and fans chanted, Charlie, Charlie, it's for you. <laughs> 1997, the original raised basketball floor was replaced. Here on the left, volunteers cut the floor into various size pieces. Uh, the countertops and the press box, shown on the right, on the arena floor are made from these sections from the old fieldhouse floor. So are sections of various sizes and shapes that can be found today in homes and businesses of bowling high school fans all over. A large piece of that original floor, which includes the center circle and the block letter M, is hung from the rafters above the east balcony. Surrounding it are banners listing Moline Boys Basketball All-State honorees. Two Moline Boys have received All-State Basketball recognition twice. White Eber Street in 1954 and 55, and Travis Wilson in 1997 and 98. Her street went on to coach the Maroons from 1979 to 1985. Wilson holds the all-time career scoring record for Moline with 1,654 points. Several children's literature festivals were held at Wharton in the 1990s. The 19th annual in 1998 attracted 500 students and teachers. That year the event was named after David Collins, a Moline teacher and author of children's books who had founded the festival. In the 21st century, Wharton Fieldhouse no longer hosts big-time entertainers, politicians, preachers, or pro wrestlers. The arena is devoted primarily, but not exclusively, to school-related activities. It's still a busy place. The Fieldhouse is used 50 weeks a year, six days during most weeks. It is only closed for two weeks before school starts in late August. During the school year, Wharton is used for daily practices and competition in boys and girls basketball, volleyball, wrestling, and track. During the summers, volleyball, basketball, and other athletic camps are held there. But the days of the big arena being filled to the rafters on a regular basis for basketball or for other events are gone. Nonetheless, good crowds still show up for some basketball games, such as this Moline Rock Island contest in January 2013. However, one annual event still fills the place, the annual Moline High School graduation ceremonies in May. At the 1978 50th anniversary celebration of Fieldhouse, grandsons of Theodore Finley Wharton, Richard and Russell Wharton, returned the loving cup that was presented to their grandfather at the original 1928 dedication. It now resides in a Fieldhouse trophy case. They also presented a plaque to Moline High School on behalf of the Wharton family. Richard Wharton, who's on the right, said, quote, this is a symbol of tradition and spirit here and may you never lose that in Moline. May Wharton Fieldhouse last another 50 years. <clears throat> we trust that the tradition and spirit embodied in the rich history of Wharton Fieldhouse will continue well beyond the 50 years predicted by Richard Wharton. Thank you. I'd be happy to Address any questions or comments. <coughs> difficult, difficult ones. I'll pass on to Diane. <laughs> Where was the stage located? The, well, stage stage was at the south end. Uh, the, the open, you know, the U, the balcony is a U-shaped thing. It's that open end where the stage was, and the stage was there sometimes for a year or two. Well, I'm not sure how they did it. The stair would they would take it in and out over a long time period. And then beginning about 1962, they put in more or less permanent uh, uh, bleachers there. Although those bleachers could be retracted and, and a smaller stage could be put in. 
I want everybody to know that this is only a small portion of what's in that book, and there are some really great stories involving especially gorgeous George that was way too long to read. But he even had people very fashionable at that time was to have Georgie pins that, that people would have to put in their hair. Yes. Um, you mentioned about Rock Island's um, field house competing with Moline's, but I'll bet Augustana Centennial Hall also took over some of the performances at yes. the field house. The question is about, uh, there's, there's still this competition between the Rock Island Fieldhouse and the oh, sure. Moline Fieldhouse, of course. Um, but the role of Centennial Hall at Augustana, one of the things that happened was, uh, of course, it was, it was open in 1960, uh, but that was one of the places where some visiting entertainers came as early as 1960. Uh, Victor Borger was there in 60 or 61, and some others. And also, I mentioned the sunrise services going at the field house until 73. Well, the next year they were at Centennial Hall, uh, which is, I'm, I'm a big Centennial Hall fan, but it was kind of sad because you wouldn't be able to see the, the uh, this sunlight coming up through the, uh, the, windows. And the windows in the field house if you're inside of Centennial Hall. Will I count? Yes. Are you calling me? Mary. Yes. I have to tell you that my husband, Lake Cork Mahar, was born on the day that the field house opened, December 16th, 1928. And I, growing up, I always heard this story about the first game, basketball game, at the field house. Moline played Kiwani, and the band was playing, and it was so exciting. And the first basket was made on Moline's, in Moline's basket, that was made by a Kiwani player. <laughs> and then the first basket that was made by a Moliner was Jim Rouseborough. I'm sure a lot of you remember him. And I went to see Johnny Weissmiller in probably 1947 at the Fieldhouse. Did you have any record of that? We have not been able to document that Johnny Weissmuller was there. Well, take my word for it. Buster Crab was there in 54. Buster Crab was there. So I'm wondering if you... In 54? No, this was when I was in junior high, so that would have been in the 40s. And yeah, we, could, we couldn't find it anywhere. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I just had to relay that. Thank you very much, Mary. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, is there any sort of storage building all the stuff that gets set up and then taken back down again? Um, all these events? No, not really. I mean, there is kind of a storage building out behind the field house, but I'm not sure it's used for that purpose. The, um, there, are, there is a lot of stuff that gets moved around for various kinds of activities. The uh, bleachers on the main floor that are taken out, even these days, are taken out for high school graduation, for example, and some other events. They just put those outside. And the big bleacher array at the south end is a retractable thing that they push up against the, the south wall, which used to have neat windows in it, but they've covered up the windows. So, and it's, there are a number of storage rooms, and there's a basement. And so. Another neat story about Jim Rosborough, because Jim was a member here at First Congregation Church for many, many years. His father was the superintendent of, oh no, he was the president of the school board. Uh, at the time the field house was being built. And uh, Jim uh, scored the first basket. His son played basketball for Moline and for the University of Iowa and eventually became a co uh, assistant coach to uh, Lou Dolson for the University of Iowa. Jim continued the tradition of a Rosboro playing when his son was playing um, out in Tucson, Arizona. Their team came all the way back to the field house and played at the Thanksgiving tournament so that his son would also play <laughs> at Wharton Field House. Kind of a neat story. Yeah, that's a total of four generations in the Rosborough family who are closely linked to the field house. Anything else? Yes, way in the back. Well, you can come to any high school sporting event. You could attend the... Uh, well, I, th I think the only things that you wouldn't be, might, might not be invited to would be, you know, high school dance. Something you might have to convincing that you're a high school age. Uh, graduation. graduation, you can you can walk in. I did and took a picture, uh, but it's it's mostly high school age. 